but I want to introduce my guests. And I will start from far right. Uh, Shin Shin, who is a, um, a, a reader in international communication uh, of the com uh, Communication and Med Media Institute at the University of Westminster. Oh, sorry. Shin Shin is here. They changed the, the seats. Sorry, Shin Shin. Um, and uh, Shin Shin will be talking about, she will bring to us uh, a case study of Chinese uh, uh, news agency. Then uh, uh, next uh, or after Xin Xin is Chang Xian, whom we call Julian. We've been calling him Julian for three years, so for me it's a bit difficult now to go back to your Chinese name. And Julian is, apart from being the dean of the School of Communication uh, and Design at Sun Yat-sen University, which is in Guangzhou, very south of China, he's also a former journalist, uh, specialized in investigative journalism. And um, Xi An, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I met him, he was the youngest dean in China. So I hope you are still the youngest dean in China. And then at the very far end, we have uh, uh, Fang Wang, uh, who uh, works as uh, duty, senior duty editor at uh, Financial Time uh, Chinese. And they just published today an interview they did with, uh, with uh, Donald Trump, because as you probably know, the president of China is meeting Donald Trump this week. So they are very hot and very topic. Um, all of three of my guests are uh, either still journalists, as Fang, or former journalists, and then two are academics, so nice uh, balance of academia uh, and, and practitioners. Um, my name, as I said, is Milica Pesic. Uh, um, Media Diversity Institute has been for 20 years trying to persuade media industry and media educators to respect more freedom of expression as one of the fundamental rights which obligate the states as much as media to be as inclusive as possible, meaning to, to provide public space for citizens regardless of their race, ethnicity, religion, gender, to participate in the public debates on the issues which are relevant to them. Uh, we are honored to be working with the San Yun-sen University uh, where we are jointly running series of modules, courses uh, on inclusive journalism and that's how our friendship started. Um, uh, in Chinese culture, rain means uh, good luck. So we believe that it's a good luck for us that you are here and that you are interested in this topic. As you know, there is a live streaming of this session, so, and this would be, the, you know, the recording of this event will be available for a longer time. So um, this is the, the quick introduction. Since uh, Chi An is a minority in our little group and Media Diversity Institute cares very much about, you know, including marginalized communities, people who are minority. So this will be first time in, in my professional work to let uh, the man speak first. So you are very honored, uh, Chi An, to, uh, to um, start this discussion, but before you, you go, just maybe a couple of more points. Uh, we would like this session to be as, um, as interactive as possible, so we would like you to contribute with your questions, with your comments. We would like to hear you to compare what you hear here with you know, what you know more than this situation. So um, my guests um, uh, volunteer to speak for maximum seven minutes at the beginning, and then we'll open the floor for a discussion. If there are no questions, then me being uh, also former journalist, I have a huge list of questions. Another reason why Chi An is going to speak first is because he's going to give us a broader picture on how the internet has impacted, affected um, 
journalism as a profession in China, uh, media in general, the audience, which I am particularly interested in, and then we'll have a case study coming from Xinxin uh, News Agency, and then we have Fang, who will be talking about probably one of the topics which brought you to this session, it's censorship uh, in, um, in Chinese society. So, Qian, your the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for everyone coming here. Uh, in my opinion, I think I'm minority mainly because I'm the only fat man, a fat person. Yeah, and uh, it's my great honor to be the first to uh, uh, speak. And I want to give you a, a broader view about the China's media landscape, and especially how the uh, journalism are affected by the social media in China now. And uh, the title of my speech is the uh, new media. Uh, and the reconstruction of Chinese journalism. Uh, now, I want to share some basic data of Chinese traditional media. Now, we have more than 1,000 newspapers and 2,000 TV channels and 9,000 magazines. And we all know China's media are state-owned, so they managing as a public uh, institution. So how to define public institution? I think the main function is to publicity and also to serve for the developer of the country. And, uh, but after China taken the policy of uh, opening and uh, reforming, and the majority of Chinese media now operated as an enterprise. So that means uh, it's not easy for them, uh, but they must uh, keep a balance between the political pressure and uh, the uh, commercial pressure. They must uh, make profits and also serve for the party and the country. So all the Chinese media must uh, stick to the principle of a party spirit, insisting on maximum serving for the party's governance and the social development. But in the past 10 years, uh, Chinese media, just like the American media or the other countries, and the traditional media uh, meet a, a big challenge from the uh, internet. So the print media declined rapidly in the past uh, 10 or 15 years. For most the press, the turning point is uh, around uh, 2012 to 2013. And the central level and the provincial level party paper began to uh, directly receive government's uh, subsidiary. So now they found a new uh, channel to make money is to get a sponsorship from government and not from the market. But uh, the situation for those marketing driven marketing oriental newspaper is uh, become worse and worse, like the South, uh, South uh, Metropolis Daily and, uh, and those kind of metropolitan daily in China big cities, now they become very worse and worse. And how about the chance of uh, internet, uh, internet media? And the state-run news website, such as People Daily, uh, People.com, .cn, and Xinhua, net.com, they are, they are developing quickly. And uh, those commercial news portals like uh, signer.com and uh, qq.com, they are facing severe competition from the mobile service uh, devices. And all these news portals like the signer.com and the tencent.com, they want to do some uh, original news and even investigative journalism, but uh, uh, they are, uh, uh, this kind of rights are not allowed by the government. So. Uh, the end of last year, uh, the local government canceled their uh, rights to do the original news. They just have the right to editing, editing news. They just have the right to uh, diffusion uh, the news which come from the traditional media. So that means uh, although the traditional media, they become declined rapidly, but they are still the main channel for our audience to get the original news or serious news. And uh, so let's take a look, the landscape of Chinese social media. You know, the uh, Twitter and the Facebook are all are blocked by Chinese government, but we still have our own Chinese version, like the Twitter, Chinese Twitter is Weibo, and uh, now Weibo, we have 300 million uh, monthly active users up to, to uh, 12, uh, 16. And the users in, more, in small cities increased rapidly in past three years. 
And uh, you know, WeChat now become more, more popular all over uh, the world. And uh, the WeChat now, we have 700 million monthly active users. And uh, not only uh, the WeChat, not only the social media, but uh, the biggest uh, media platform in China now. And more than 15 million WeChat official accounts. And uh, there are also uh, 10, uh, 10 million government WeChat official accounts in the WeChat. So if you ask me who is the biggest media in China, my answer is not CCTV or Xinhua News Agency, uh, but the Tencent company, because those companies have become the giant company, media company in China. WeChat, 700 billion million users, and QQ, uh, and we have 900 million users, and QQ.com, the news portal of the Tencent company, they have 284 million unique visitors. So right off information dissemination and the power of the media discourse have been changed from traditional media to new media, especially the social media. So how does new media, the social media, change the journalism in China? And the first keywords I want to say is about the structure. You could say the audience structure, uh, the younger netizens, they read no uh, uh, newspaper, but watch less TV. And uh, as for the industry structure, the internet business scale have half an entire media market now. And the ownership uh, structure, although the, all the traditional media are state-owned, but those main commercial newspaper and commercial news bottle are owned by the foreign group of their founders. So they are private-owned, not state-owned. How about the power structure, Weibo and all the main commercial news portal based in Beijing? And uh, so, uh, and also uh, the which uh, the QQ.com based in Beijing. That means what? It means if our central government want to give their banning, it's easily just to give the Beijing municipal government, uh, and it's easily to control all the, uh, the news portal. Uh, they, both of them, their newsroom are based in Beijing. So second the keywords is news production. I think the same phen phenomenon in America or other country. The producer are moving from, from, from professionalism to socialism. So you could see the UGC contact become more and more important for those news portal. And the news organization attaining from uh, opacity to the transparency, the, uh, from backstage to the front stage. And the production frequency is shifting from periodism to circulation. So real-time news and instant news become more and more uh, attractive for the younger people. So let's take a conclusion. As the impact of social media in journalism in China, I think uh, in a social media dominant area, user developer a habit of mobile reading and uh, fragmental reading. People tend to judge the truthfulness by mainly maybe sometimes or occasionally uh, random, uh, uh, usually by se sensation and feeling, not by logic. Decline of quality journalism and uh, reducing investments in series and uh, original news. And the social media platform and other new technology cannot push for the overall improvement of media industry in, made in China now. And the state is uh, tightening up control over the media, especially the new media. And uh, so the media become more and more tended to, uh, tamed to the state power. So self-censorship also become more popular. Mm -hmm. The role of watchdog is weakening. And as I survey about five years ago, they are totally about no more, what, 350 investigative reporters in China now, uh, about five years ago, but this year, I did a, a second uh, national survey about investigative, investigative reporters. There are just uh, no more than 150 investigative reporters in China. So social media has given rise to an extremely active online public opinion field. But however, the field is far from mature and uh, rational. So my conclusion about the social media and uh, its impact uh, about Chinese uh, journalism as just a uh, maybe three sentences. Firstly, the strong intervention and the effective supervision of a political power have failed to generate the more space and independence for internet journalism than traditional media. Secondly, the shortage, 
scientific and profit-driven market has made the internet journalism difficulty to build the norms and values of professionalism in the commercial websites, where the popular sensationalism and commercialism improves the quality and the standards of internet news. And thirdly, the discourse of deep professionalization would lead to weakened self-identity and professional journalists. But the communicative empowerment and information breakfast of the internet technology have brought about the opportunity to enhance the right to know and the right to express for a few citizens and institutions. That's what I want to share with you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Xin Xin would like actually you to see a short film, only a couple of uh, yeah. 30 seconds, and then, yeah, so we hope the film will be yeah, there. The tape, Microphone, make sure. I had very few points about how central media in China, like Xinhua, trying to adapt to the new digital and social media environment. So first, let me just show you a very short video clip and just give you a taste of it. I see the film is on the... Oh, okay. Um, yes, Professor Zhang just mentioned, so the rise of social media and their dominance by privately owned internet companies like BATS. So what kind of space left for central media like state news agency Xinhua? What Xinhua is doing? So I want to show you this uh, video, which is pa um, posted by Xinhua on YouTube and Facebook on 2nd February. 2016. It was also circulated on Chinese popular social media platforms such as WeChat. And this video clip is uh, still not ready. Which we hope yeah. will be there soon. Yeah. <laughs> and this video, I, I guess most of you have seen it or already heard of it. It's reciting Xi Jinping's political slogans derived uh, from his famous ideological directive, the so-called four comprehensives, uh, in Chinese, Si Ge Quan Mian. Yeah, this uh, so-called four comprehensives refer to Xi's calls on all party members to comprehensively um, build a moderately prosperous society, comprehensively deepen reform, comprehensively govern the nation, according uh, to law, comprehensively, strictly govern the party. So these uh, four uh, slogans were announced in December 2014, and together um, encapsulate his political philosophy. And this video, yeah, we're still not able to see it, so that's a problem when we're relying on uh, yeah, we can blame internet, so not just uh, useful to Maybe also you can, can go on problem. and then if the film... Uh, okay, there. so I want to yeah. show this video, if I show you, it's used the rap music originating from the US and use animated cartoons and to promote Xi's policy. And this is a prominent example of how traditional party organs like Xinhua are using Western popular culture forms, such as rap music and cartoon, I just mentioned, via social media for the purpose of popularizing politics. And this is a topic has been discussed widely in the US, in the UK, in Italy, and in other Western democracies. So now it seems that something similar seems to be going on in authoritarian China. And certainly the nature and the implications of this phenomenon, and which is clearly is linked with the rise of social media in China, is certainly 
worth investigating and given its novelty in the Chinese context. And certainly I'm not going to elaborate this point here, but I want to um, point it out. It's interesting to note the video managed uh, to reach a wider audience through the amplifying effects of social media in combination with the traditional media coverage. And actually, upon releasing this video, uh, Xinhua also published a self-promotion -prom story uh, about this um, video in several languages. And the English title headline was Xinhua promotes the four prehensives via, uh, with a rap. On the same day, the New York Times written both in, uh, also published a story about the video, written both in English and Chinese. The title of their article was, Video Extorts China's Party Slogans, Turning into Rap and Beethoven. CNN and The Guardian also posted this video and also um, published an article about it. So you can see through not just the uh, social media, also in combination with the reactions from traditional, uh, mainstream, uh, from mainstream media, Xinhua has managed to turn the release of this video into a news event. And another aspect is worth noting that, as Professor Zhang already mentioned, all YouTubes, the, po uh, the popular social media platforms such as YouTube, Facebook, and even the New York Times online service website are currently not accessible um, without using any circumvention technologies in China. And Xinhua actually, uh, of course, there are the, the, the long list on the blocking list, uh, including a number of NGOs' websites as well. And for Xinhua journalists based in mainland China, actually, they have to rely on VPN services, virtual private networks, in order to be able to access their Facebook account, for example. Okay, ready. Okay. Here we come. <laughs> Why is it already? Yeah, it's very quickly. Yeah, it's very quickly. Okay, just give you a taste of it. So um, now just uh, Xinhua um, run, um, releases news, not just uh, via YouTube, Twitter, um, Facebook, also use Google Plus. And their small team consisting, well, by Xinhua standards, small team consisting around 100 journalists, not just based uh, in Beijing and also around the world, updating their uh, overseas social media platform pages around the clock on a daily basis. And, and certainly you can see promoting party states policy has become Xinhua news agency's uh, uh, daily journalism practice. And certainly, Xinhua is not the only one. And actually, according to a report, a study published uh, by Norman, Beijing Norman University, and 80% of the central media, they're using Facebook. And they're also using other um, overseas social media platforms. And Xinhua is uh, far from, um, uh, actually Xinhua is not uh, the best uh, central media with the, um, with, the uh, with the largest media presence on these platforms. 
um, People's Daily and CCTV, they actually do much better job than Xinhua. But in comparison with the Western media, of course, they lag far behind from their Western counterparts. So I just want to say in conclusion, yes, please. okay, so despite of the innovative use of uh, the forms of a culture, popul uh, popular culture, including rap music and other forms, there are far more continuities than discontinuities in Xinhua and other Chinese traditional media journalism, uh, journalism practice via social media. And this is clear the case in terms of uh, how news is defined, which sources are cited, and which ideolo ideological messages are chosen and to uh, promote. And certainly this is not based on my uh, academic study, uh, just uh, my personal observation. And certainly I would like to stop here so leave more time for discussion. Thanks, Xin Xin. Sorry for this little technical, but as you can see, our guests have learned how to circumvent problems, so the little gadget they brought from China actually helped us see the film, not the internet here in Perugia or in Italy. So thanks for bringing your little gadgets, which bring us nicely to the topic uh, uh, Feng is going to talk about how to find the way to bring the information and not to um, suffer consequences if possible. Please, Feng. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, very interesting panel. Uh, I'll probably start by uh, an interview I did with the author of a recent uh, bestseller called Alibaba, uh, the guy who's actually from uh, the UK. He wrote this book about the biggest internet company in China called Alibaba. It's actually w one of the bestsellers. Um, he told me that he has this feeling uh, these days when he go, uh, when he leaves China, um, he has this feeling that he's going uh, backwards in terms of the technology he can enjoy. So in China, uh, we have like gadgets like this. We have uh, social media that's blossoming um, with very, very advanced technology. Perhaps uh, our WeChat is far more advanced than what's up the, the original version of this instant messaging service. Um, but uh, my Xin Xin and Zhian talked about the very strong impact um, that technology and social media has has had on Chinese industry, media industry. Perhaps here I will share with you my observations of uh, perhaps not that positive side of the story, uh, how a technology advancement has also empowered uh, our senses and how um, uh, they have more techniques and more means to control uh, the content that's uh, dis distributed on the internet. Um, so for most of you uh, present here, I, I guess uh, you know about the censorship in China. It's something that everyone who works for the media industry in China lives with. Um, so. Perhaps I'll just give you some details and I mean how they, they do this. Um, so for most media co outlets, they face both pre-print and post-print censorship. Uh, by print, uh, pre-print censorship, that means the government, because all the domestic media outlets, as Zhian said, are controlled by the party, uh, the party or the government can just, they have direct channels, connection channels with all media outlets. They can just issue orders directly to those outlets, asking them not to uh, report on certain <coughs> topics, ask them to take care of uh, the commentary pieces, ask them to be very cautious about the comments made by readers under the stories, to delete um, certain I mean, certain remarks by readers, made by readers. Um, for post-print um, censorship, the articles that make the government upset um, or nervous can be taken out, deleted, um, blocked by the government um, because they, have, uh, they can control all the server providers and all the stories 
uh, dis distributed on the internet. They live on certain servers and the government can just order the provi server provider to take out a certain stories. Uh, I work for the Chinese website published by the Financial Times, which is a UK newspaper. Uh, as a foreign media outlet, outlet we mainly face um, um, post-print uh, censorship because the government doesn't have a, a, a direct channel to talk to us. So if we publish something that makes them unhappy, they just block the access to our stories or to our website because our server, most foreign media outlets have their servers based outside China, so they cannot just take out certain stories, but they can use the so-called Great Firewall. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. It's basically um, a tech technology that enables the government to cut off the access um, to certain websites based outside China. So that story is unaccessible afterwards. You get a 404 error page when you try to click on that story. Um, so I'll give you some examples. The most, uh, most recent example of censorship um, is perhaps the, the, the censorship, censorship of the inauguration of Donald Trump, which is to me a quite peculiar case because um, this is, I mean, the government issued an order to most domestic, all of them, domestic media asking them to not do live streaming, live stream of the inauguration, not to do any picture coverage of the inauguration, just stick straightly, uh, strictly to the speech he makes and the, the, the ceremony, perhaps the, the procedure of the ceremony, but not to elaborate, not to make any commentaries on the, the, the inauguration. Um, so most analysis I've seen, uh, the point is why the government does this, because uh, Trump uh, was considered to be quite unfriendly to China, and the Chinese government was trying to figure out, I mean, how his Chinese policy would be. So at that particular sensitive moment, they want to control media, they want to control speeches, I mean, remarks put on the internet, so that not to make things more complicated. That's perhaps one reason, but my own interpretation is that uh, there is another reason for the censorship. I think um, no matter how controversial, how divisive Trump's victory uh, was, he was um, elected in the, in the election. Um, and no matter how perhaps half of the American population don't like him, they still respected the results of the election. So he was sworn in. So this testament of democracy at work uh, perhaps comes as a sort of an, an easy fact to the Chinese government. So for a combination of reasons, this inauguration uh, was not allowed to be, um, to be reported uh, as freely as media companies would like to. So they have to st strictly control what they can say. So I'm just, I was just giving you an example of how censorship works. Um, and other taboo areas, perhaps, um, if you like, um, include human rights issues, uh, labor unrest, ethnic minority affairs, religious affairs, um, and the most, I mean, most sensitive topic is perhaps the, um, okay, the private wealth of our national leaders, I mean, the leaders at the top. Uh, perhaps you know that the Chinese website of New York Times and Bloomberg, both of them were blocked totally, completely, uh, because of their reports on the wealth, family wealth of our leaders. Okay, so I want to just say a few words about how social media comes into this picture. Um, so at FT Chinese, I've been working for FT Chinese for seven years. Through the years, I've witnessed, we've witnessed the sort of advancement of technology used by the government to control the information on the internet. When we started in 2009, eight, nine, 
we, when the government is unhappy about, was unhappy about something that we published, they had no other means but to shut down the whole website because the technology was not that advanced. They, they just shut down the whole, I mean, the, the access to the overall website. Gradually, they, they developed this technology that enabled them to um, deny access to a certain story or a certain channel, a certain page. But the, the home page of the website was accessible. Um, and then um, they have this very tricky technique that we, we all felt very annoyed, uh, is that if you clicked on one of the sensitive um, stories, headlines, then your computer, your IP address would be forbidden to visit any of the other stories on the same website for a few minutes. But after like seven or eight minutes, you are fine. You can continue reading on, but most people lost patience during the seven or eight minutes. They get the feeling, okay, maybe the whole website was blocked. And basically the, the scheme is just to, the, the, mechan the, the, the machine just makes your experience with one particular website very unpleasant. And over time, you just give up visiting that website. Um, now, social media, came along social media, and um, of course all media outlets um, have their own accounts on various social media platforms. For example, FT Chinese, we have a Weibo account, we have the WeChat account, we also have an account on the Chinese equivalent of Quora, the, the question and answer website. We, we distribute our stories. Um, so we've noticed different ways by the Chinese government to, to contain um, or to, to control how we dis distribute our content. They could, uh, first, they could uh, forbid or um, uh, forbid the forwarding of a particular story. So readers of our stories cannot forward it further on. They could, um, deny the, uh, the, the access to comment a section, so our readers cannot comment on the particular story. Uh, they can um, make the story invisible to others. So for example, we published a story on our Weibo account. We can see that story in our own pa on our page, but our fa followers, they cannot see the story in their feed, so that's very tricky. So we, we sometimes cannot tell whether a particular story is blocked or not. They can delete the whole link altogether because all these servers are based in China. And the ultimate weapon is to cancel your account altogether and, um, and the social media platforms will have, um, they can't do anything but to obey um, the cancellation. And don't forget, uh, as Xingxing just said, uh, all the state-owned media companies and the government, different various government bodies have their own social media accounts uh, through which they can uh, distribute uh, their own voice, their version of the stories. Um, and they have, so the, the art of censorship is becoming more and more sophisticated, um, no longer the old traditional tacky way of propagate. So uh, my conclusion is the the sort of the escalated version of the mouse and cat game um, is still ongoing and social media um, plays this very important and key role in this and it empowers the people, the public, and empowers the, the censor at the same time. Thanks, Wang. <laughs> well, we have 20 minutes if you want to comment to ask questions. Um, our guests are here. The pictures of you are already being sent straight to China <laughs> through little gadgets. <laughs> so um, some of the things I've heard uh, resonate with what I've known uh, from some other parts of the world. There are, there are parts platforms there, all these kind of IT uh, companies have built it in the West, in China, but the content is still um, an issue uh, how to, in the West, you know, how to, to deal with the hate speech in China, how to control uh, any kind of criticism of the authorities, but the floor is yours. 
If you have any questions, yes, please. Can we just wait for the microphone, please, because of the live streaming? Okay. Yes. Zona? Yeah? Okay. Um, I don't know whether this is an obvious question, but for example, I'm from Deutsche Welle, and our Chinese language news website, as far as I know, is completely blocked the entire time. So I wonder why that temporary blocking is always a thing, why it's always Süddeutsche as well, which is a German newspaper, has temporarily been blocked a lot of the times, but why is, doesn't it happen that it just, if, for example, Financial Times China is too controversial or whatever, why didn't they shut it down completely or just shut down the access completely? Your question is to all panelists or you want someone particular to answer? Yep, please. Who wants to? I get this question all the time. Uh, to be very honest with you, uh, we don't know. We're probably, FT Chinese is probably the only surviving uh, Chinese service, Chinese language website run by a foreign media company that's still accessible uh, in the mainland. Most of our rivals, including New York Times, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, Reuters, their Chinese websites have all been blocked. Um, we don't know why we are still accessible. Um, but I can share with you what I personally think. Uh, I think maybe a couple reasons. First one is we are a European, new we are a UK newspaper, European newspaper. So Europe, the UK is <laughs> not anymore. It's not yes, the EU member, UK, but it's European. Uh, yes, a UK. So UK is seen as sort of less competitive not like the US, which is the arch rival of China. So we're less threatening. And Financial Times is considered to be more specialized in finance and economics, which gives it a sort of less political uh, tone. That also helps. But the most important thing is, um, I think during the years, increasingly when a Chinese politician, a, a, a national leader, visits, pay uh, an official visit to a European country, they have, they develop this habit of, of writing a commentary piece and getting it published on the European newspaper before they arrive in that country. And very often, when they visit a European country, they would choose the Financial Times. So when the FT published articles from, for example, Prime Minister, uh, Premier Li Keqiang, or other senior officials, it sort of, sort of sends out a message to lower level of governments. Okay, because see, the, premi the, the, the Premier has just written for the, for the FT. It's kind of endorsement for the FT. So it just makes them think twice before they do something to us. And also, I think lastly, popularity also helps because we are, We've been there longest. Uh, we we have the largest audience, um, so we're so popular that makes it harder for them to to just block it completely because the, the, it will backfire, um, something like that. But smaller news outlets, perhaps yes, it's more risky. And well, yeah, that, that's Valley, my Deutsche Welle is European paper yeah. too. So, and you come from a, a rival yeah. media outlet. Maybe she, 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 uh, Julian would like to say, is there always a system like plan? We will block this one, this one, or there is some spontaneity or no rules. I, as an observer, uh, I have my answer about why FT Chinese do not block the. Uh, you know, another uh, website about is from Singapore, this Xiaobao.com. Uh, it's also not to be uh, blocked by China. And those two foreign uh, Chinese websites, foreign Chinese websites could make money in China. I think the main reason is uh, the FT Chinese not uh, concerned about those sensitive political I issue, mainly about the financial news and the lifestyle news. So in comparison with New York, Di New York Times, it's the contact are not so sensitive and not easily make the central government upset. Another reason is the, how to say, the boss of Chinese, uh, FT Chinese, I think they have direct 
how to say, negotiating or uh, dialogue way with the public, uh, publicity department, I, I think. I know that part. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. So okay. the last reason, I think, is the central Chinese government still need some symbol to show our, our country's openness. They just want a hint and give you a hint that if you obey the regulation of a country, you could still make money in China now, like take example the FD Chinese. So I think may, maybe it's also reason. Yeah, I just guess uh, according to my feeling and observation. Yeah, thank uh, you. Point. Actually, we also do political and sensitive stories, but um, as I said, the most sensitive issue in the past few years is the wealth uh, of the, the leaders. And on that particular topic, the New York Times and Bloomberg, they, they reported extensively. It's not the FT doesn't want to report on that, but we, we didn't have a good enough sources on that particular topic, but I have to say we also cover political issues. Um, um, yeah, just. Thanks. Um, more comments, questions? Yes, please. There, and then the gentleman. Hello, I have a question. Uh, since we mentioned about men, uh, censorship, uh, is there a uniform, uh, uh, I think there is a great firewall it is uh, uh, technical. Uh, it is technical uh, strength uh, of the government. Uh, my question is: uh, Is there a uniform uh, platform uh, that uh, blocks which website you cannot access uh, as a whole of the country, or uh, it differs from province to province since? Uh, uh, if I uh, the, if like New York Times, uh, they reported uh, a problem in Beijing, but uh, maybe in the Beijing government uh, they want to block it, but uh, it uh, won't interfere other provinces. Is there a uniform uh, platform that uh, can block every uh, website that cannot access, or it differs from province to province? Thank you. Who do you want to answer your question? Anyone from our panel? Yeah. Um, I, I know specific. Uh, okay, well, yes. good question, but um, my observation is it's national, uh, it's at national level. If a blockage happens, it happens nationwide. It doesn't differ from province to province because it, w it to be to, for New York Times website to be to be plop, blocked, it has to come. I mean, the order has to come from a very high level government body. So it won't be um, it won't be a decision made locally. The two uh, uh, provinces are very special and unique in mainland China. Is Xinjiang and uh, Xi'an. Yeah, yeah, Tibetan. Yeah, these uh, two provinces uh, they will have the local more strict uh, uh, yeah, control about the social media and the website, I think. Mm. Um, the gentleman here and then, then gentleman in third. No, um, sorry, first this one. Yeah, can I just ask, okay. um, do you think that the range of um, issues that are considered to be sensitive and therefore are um, censored are, are increasing? Are, are they censoring more different issues than they were three, four, five years ago? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the sensitive area may be not uh, changeable a uh, lot in the past uh, several years. Uh, but the, uh, how to say, the controversial or sensitive uh, comments um, become more and more envisionable. You know, uh, before uh, three years ago, uh, before 2013, the Weibo are very active, most active online public opinion the space for China intellectual and uh, uh, commentary, they criticize the local government and the central government. But uh, when our central government take a policy to uh, 
mainly you know some those online public opinion leaders are controlled, and uh, so now Weibo as a p online public uh, space become uh, decreased, but more and more cr criticized moved into the WeChat group. Yeah, I joined a lot of uh, WeChat group. They are very active and uh, they criticize about the government and public affairs are still very uh, hot and active, but uh, they are visionable. They are not a public for the ordinary netizen, I think. I have a question from Dr. Xinxin. Thank you for your fascinating uh, presentation and video. And um, I noted that uh, all the presenters uh, focus a little bit more on the role of new media. I would like to ask you uh, some information about uh, the role of traditional media, because we know that China is trying to uh, sell, uh, spread, is, uh, develop its image outside Chinese border um, since uh, quite a long time. So I would like to understand which kind of uh, strategy has been implemented and which kind of difference, if there is some difference, between traditional and new media. Okay, thank you for your question. And yes, so you actually refer to China's uh, so-called soft power project. And against this background, of course, is uh, according to Harvard professor Joseph Nye. And you know, social media actually has become a battlefield for charm offensive. And, and certainly this is the case also in eyes of Chinese uh, propaganda authorities. They want to, um, in general, they want all state-owned Chinese media to um, increase their presence abroad, especially central media, um, including Xinhua. And what they have been doing, I think, is uh, still at early stage, basically try to um, expand their infrastructure. For example, Xinhua News Agency has established uh, um, 180 uh, overseas uh, branches around the world. And also their spread of a Confucius Institute and try to add to the media influence and uh, help promote Chinese culture and image abroad. And I know there are several Italian universities also have established the Confucius Institutes. But certainly for media at this stage, they try to figure out what they can do. And the strategy is clear is saying, okay, um, the government provides both the regulatory and financial support based uh, on projects. And for example, Xinhua has uh, launched uh, a TV service which is only available outside China to avoid head-on competition with, CT, uh, with CCTV. And you can know Xinhua also start using social media but also other uh, traditional media as well. But to a certain degree, they have also become victims of the regulatory framework. You know, for Xinhua journalists, they also have to rely on circumvention technologies. And when they go abroad, because it's their ownership, structure and because they how closely work with the party, with the state. And so their image abroad, you know, is still problematic. So there are barriers, there are opportunities, uh, you know, created by the government, but what they, they have been uh, achieving and whether, you know, they're effective is still a question. I think they are very interesting, positive phenomenon. Maybe, maybe we could, uh, we probably missed that is the China government are very smart. They know how to utilize the social media to empower themselves. Like, you know, in China, there are 100,000 government WeChat official accounts. And uh, the local government are very active response to the online public opinion, yeah. And so I found that the public, uh, uh, how to say, the policy uh, become more and more <coughs> deeply affected by the online criticize. Yeah, so I think uh, that's maybe another uh, uh, phenomenon. And uh, just uh, like the mainstream newspaper, Xinhua News Agency, utilize social media, international social media to be soft power and our governments and also utilize the social media as to their soft power, I think, yeah. 
Okay, I just want to add one point. Actually, if you look at how Facebook described it, they're not saying the blog, they're saying not directly uh, accessed. Uh, and then actually, Xinhua, um, um, Xinhua going out, CCTV going out, and even Huawei, and they have brought huge amount of uh, advertising revenue to Facebook, Twitter in the past two years. And their advertising revenue, despite the, the fact only 5% of Chinese internet users able to access within mainland China, but it's a huge number, almost equivalent to a Spanish uh, population, and actually have brought huge profit to this company. So when we talk about like, uh, you know, within China, and uh, on the one hand, Chinese traditional media going out, struggling to reach an um, audience ab abroad, but still, you know, they create a new market for this uh, mm -hmm. uh, internet companies. I just want to add some information. I study in Japan, and I send some link of Chinese version website of Japan's media to my friend in China now, and just now, and she checked it for me. And uh, the uh, two websites of the Japanese, Japan's media are usable, are accessible in China at this time. It, uh, they are uh, Japanese economic newspaper, uh, and another one is uh, public broadcasting system of NHK, the, uh, the, Chinese, uh, new, uh, the Ch Chinese version website of NHK is accessible. So I think I agree with Professor John's viewpoint because the Japanese economic newspaper is something uh, more focused on news uh, on economics and NHK is, is a public bro uh, broadcasting system um, actually even China so you know uh, even China Japan relationship is not in a good um, situation now but NHK seldom um, take China story very negatively so I think um, it's not about uh, if the sensitive uh, if there is sensitive, a politic sensitive story, but uh, it's about if the government think these media are taking China story negatively. I get, I just guess, I don't know if you agree with me. Okay. Does anyone want to agree or disagree? I, I think you do have a point, yes, yeah. yes, I agree. If the foreign media do not threaten uh, China's uh, society sociability and uh, its national interest, uh, maybe the government will allow you to accessible in China. I think you have the point. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Any more questions, comments? Yes, please. Because I have a couple of questions. Thank you very much. I'm, I used to work in China as a foreign journalist, and the pillars of my research was actually my, the Chinese staff, and they're the ones who are mostly in danger of uh, getting any story out. So are there any particular stories that you guys do not do for your personal safety, or refuse to do? <laughs> uh. You know this, this is live streaming, streamed session, so. There well, is always but there's also self-censorship too, because even for foreign media, we do have like there are certain colleagues of mine who will time certain stories out, you know, for the safety of their staff and for you know the visa renewal time. So like, are there particular stories that your bosses have asked you to do, and then? Mm, no, actually. No, actually. Um, working for the FT, we don't self-censor. Um, I, I was just earlier, I was at this uh, panel about freedom of expression in southern Europe and the panelists there in that session talked about their experience of being attacked or some of them killed. Um, I think that kind of thing, I mean, it, it's not that bad in China. Uh, the pressure most fall on the organization, the media outlets, instead of falling on individual reporters. Um, at the FT, I wouldn't think of anything that the editor would actually tell us not to cover. There's no such taboo area. 
I'm not sure about other. A few years ago, there was this um, uh, internal conflict in Bloomberg, I think. Their reporters tried to get a story published, but was, uh, that story was put on shelf for, I mean, by the editor. And I, I think a few journalists got so angry I don't know, they quit or something? I can't remember the details. I think it was Michael, I forget his last name, but he moved to New York Times. Yeah. Something but also like Bloomberg that. is also a, you know, they, they have the terminals as well, right? So yes, between you have to choose between business and news. Yes. But, um, but maybe, uh, Feng, maybe uh, because you just mentioned this, the, the session Southeast Europe and, and freedom of press, there was a talk there about self-censorship. Um, is there... Do you feel that you or your colleagues practice that consciously or subconsciously? Like My colleagues pa at the Panama FT. Papers, there was enough sources to report that there were high-level Chinese politicians mm -hmm. with nice accounts mm -hmm. in Panama. Is there such a thing as self-censorship? At the FT, no, we don't. Um, maybe it sounds more ideal. Uh, than reality, but I can't think of one incident where the reporter was told by the editor not to go to a certain area to, to cover something. Um, we know if we report on this particular topic, it will get blocked. We know for sure before, beforehand. So it's more to do whether you want to go big on the story or if you want to go light on the story. But I don't think there is one single topic that's not touchable uh, at the FT, I think. Okay. My answer, my answer is, you can easily get the answer. The keywords which you could not post in Chinese website is the, I think, the sensitive area. You could not report it. And Another, as for the censorship, I think it's not a just a practice, but a awareness. It's a structural feelings about uh, your worry. And it's not easy for media to admit, especially for foreign media like the FD Chinese, to admit they are censorship in their newsroom. But I know, I believe they know what's the bottom line, what's the difference between your story are censored and uh, the, your company are cancelled. I think they know the bottom line, I think. I just want to add one thing. I can talk about the tactics that we use in the newsroom uh, to play this game with the propaganda, uh, with the censor. Uh, so I work for the Chinese website, we, so we, we translate a lot of FT content into Chinese, uh, which cons consists, uh, which sort of is um, contributes to half of the content we publish every day on FT Chinese. So whenever the FT writes a story that we think is very sensitive to the Chinese government, we probably will not, we will translate it in full version. We don't cut it down. We don't cut out the sensitive parts. We would translate the story, we would put it out, but we, we'll, we will not use it as a cover story. We will not use it as the lead story for a channel. We will not put it out on the social media, which we think, I mean, I mean, things go faster on social media than on websites. So that, those are the tactics that we use. Um, but all the stories that the FT does, I can't speak for the FT because we actually work separately from the FT. The FT has their bureaus uh, in different Chinese cities, and we, the Chinese website, work separately from the Beijing bureau. We, we're also based in Beijing. We can't speak for them, but at FT Chinese, we translate and publish every single, sto every single story about China, even those very critical and sensitive ones, and we put them out. Maybe not that high on the page. That's how we do. So you put on the sport and then whoever is, wants to go there, you, you can find it. Uh, are there any other questions, comments? We, we are having signs that we have to, to finish. Maybe final word from each uh, panelist. Uh, 300 investigative journalists in a country with one billion 
300 million people is, says something, but obviously there, is, there, there are ways to circumvent. Uh, there is still a lot of things to discuss, but uh, our uh, colleagues are here. If you have more questions, uh, um, live stream, st live screen, stre screaming, whatever, streaming will be just in this room so we can talk outside of the room, yeah? Thank you very much for being with us, for asking questions. Thank you to the panelists, and hope to see you next year at this festival. Thank you. Thank you. I have a huge list of questions. Another reason why Che An is going to speak first is because he's going to give us a broader picture on how the internet has impacted, affected um, uh, journalism as a profession in China, uh, media in general, the audience, which I'm particularly interested in, and then we'll have a case study coming from Xinxin uh, News Agency, and then we have Fang, who will be talking about probably one of the topics which brought you to this session, it's censorship uh, in, um, in Chinese society. So, Qian, your the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for everyone coming here. Uh, in my opinion, I think I'm minority mainly because I'm the only fat man, a fat person. Yeah, and uh, it's my great honor to be the first to uh, uh, speak. And I want to give you a, a broader view about the China's media landscape, and especially how the uh, journalism affected by the social media in China now. And uh, the title of my speech is the uh, new media. Uh, and the reconstruction of Chinese journalism. Uh, now, I want to share some basic data of Chinese traditional media. Now, we have more than 1,000 newspapers and 2,000 TV channels and 9,000 magazines. And we all know China's media are state-owned, so they managing as a public uh, institution. So how to define public institution? I think the main function is to publicity and also to serve for the developer of the country. And, uh, but after China taken the policy of uh, opening and uh, reforming, and the majority of Chinese media now operated as an enterprise. So that means uh, it's not easy for them, uh, but they must uh, keep a balance between the political pressure and uh, the uh, commercial pressure. They must uh, make profits and also serve for the party and the country. So all the Chinese media must uh, stick. Respect more freedom of expression as one of the fundamental rights which obligate the states as much as media to be as inclusive as possible, meaning to, to provide public space for citizens regardless of their race, ethnicity, religion, gender, to participate in the 
public debates on the issues which are relevant to them. Uh, we are honored to be working with the San Yunsen University uh, where we are jointly running series of modules, courses uh, on inclusive journalism and that's how our friendship started. Um, uh, in Chinese culture, rain means uh, good luck. So we believe that it's a good luck for us that you are here and that you are interested in this topic. As you know, there is a live streaming of this session, so, and this would be, the, you know, the recording of this event will be available for a longer time. So um, this is the, the quick introduction. Since uh, Chi'an is a minority in our little group and Media Diversity Institute cares very much about, you know, including marginalized communities, people who are minority. So this will be first time in, in my professional work to let uh, the man speak first. So you are very honored, uh, Chi'an, to, uh, to um, start this discussion, but before you, you go, just maybe a couple of more points. Uh, we would like this session to be as, um, as interactive as possible, so we would like you to contribute with your questions, with your comments. We would like to hear you to compare what you hear here with you know, what you know more than this situation. So um, my guests um, uh, volunteer to speak for maximum seven minutes at the beginning, and then we'll open the floor for a discussion. If there are no questions, then me being uh, also former journalist. Time declined rapidly, but they are still the main channel for our audience to get the original news or serious news. And uh, so let's take a look the landscape of Chinese social media. You know, the uh, Twitter and the Facebook are all are blocked by Chinese government, but we still have our own Chinese version, like the Twitter. Chinese Twitter is Weibo, and uh, now Weibo, we have 300 million uh, monthly active users, up to, to uh, 12, uh, 16. And the users in, more, in small cities increased rapidly in past three years. And, uh, you know, WeChat now become more, more popular all over uh, the world. And uh, the WeChat now, we have 700 million monthly active users. And uh, not only uh, the WeChat, not only the social media, but uh, the biggest uh, media platform in China now. And more than 15 million WeChat official accounts. And uh, they are also uh, 10, uh, 10 million government WeChat official accounts in the WeChat. So if you ask me who is the biggest media in China, my answer is not CCTV or Xinhua News Agency, uh, but the Tencent company, because those companies have become the giant company, media company in China. WeChat, 700 billion million users, and QQ, uh, and we have 900 million users, and QQ.com, the news portal of the Tencent company, they have 284 million unique visitors. So right off information dissemination and the power of the media discourse have been changed from traditional media to new media, especially the social media. So how does new media, the social media change the journalism in China? And the first keywords I want to say is about the structure. You could see the audience structure, uh, the younger Netizen, they read no uh, res uh, newspaper, but watch less TV. And uh, as for the industry structure, the internet business scale have half an entire meet to the principle of a party spirit, insisting on maximum serving for the party's governance and the social development. But in the past 10 years, uh, Chinese media, just like the American media or the other countries, and the traditional media, uh, meet a, a bigger challenge from the uh, internet. So the print media declined uh, rapidly in the past uh, 10 or 15 years. For most uh, press, the turning point is uh, around uh, 2012 to 2013. And the central level and the provincial level party paper began to uh, directly receive government uh, subsidiary. So now they found a new uh, channel to make money is to get a sponsorship from government and not from the market. 
but uh, the situation for those marketing-driven, marketing-oriented newspaper is uh, become worse and worse. Like the South uh, South uh, Metropolis Daily and uh, and those kind of metropolitan daily in China big cities now they become very worse and worse. And how about the chance of uh, internet uh, internet media and the state-run the news website such as People Daily, uh, People.com, .cn, and XinhuaNet.com they are they are developing quickly. And uh, those commercial news portal like uh, Sina.com and uh, QQ.com, they are facing severe competition from the mobile service uh, de devices. And all these news portal like the Sina.com and the Tencent.com, they want to do some uh, original news and even investigative journalism, but uh, uh, they are, uh, uh, this kind of rights are not allowed by the government. So uh, the end of last year, uh, the local government cancelled their uh, rights to do the original news. They just have the right to editing, editing news. They just have the right to uh, diffusion uh, the news which come from the traditional media. So that means uh, although the traditional media, they... Be but I want to introduce my guests, and I will start from far right. Uh, Xin Xin, who is a, um, a, a reader in international communication uh, of the Com uh, Communication and Med Media Institute at the University of Westminster. Oh, sorry, Xin Xin is here. They changed the, the seats, sorry, Xin Xin. Um, and uh, Xin Xin will be talking about, she will bring to us uh, a case study of Chinese uh, uh, news agency. Then uh, uh, next uh, or after Xin Xin is Chang Xi'an, whom we call Julian. We've been calling him Julian for three years, so for me it's a bit difficult now to go back to your Chinese name. And Julian is, apart from being the dean of the School of Communication uh, and Design at Sun Yat-sen University, which is in Guangzhou, very south of China, he's also a former journalist, uh, specialized in investigative journalism. And um, Xi'an, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I met him, he was the youngest dean in China. So I hope you are still the youngest dean in China. And then at the very far end, we have uh, uh, Fang Wang, uh, who uh, works as a duty, senior duty editor at uh, Financial Time uh, Chinese. And they just published today an interview they did with, uh, with uh, Donald Trump, because as you probably know, the president of China is meeting Donald Trump this week. So they are very hot and very topic. Um, all of three of my guests are uh, either still journalists, as Fang, or former journalists, and then two are academics, so nice uh, balance of academia uh, and, and practitioners. Um, my name, as I said, is Milica Pesic. Uh, um, Media Diversity Institute has been for 20 years trying to persuade media industry and media educators to respond